general education teachers are so much more than just teachers. They often have large class sizes, have to teach multiple subjects or have multiple preps, and let's not forget about all of their other duties, including attendance and recess, student illnesses, assemblies and fundraisers, map testing or other testing windows, surprise parent visits, staff meetings, new students, and other technology issues. Some days it can feel impossible to get everything accomplished and leave in one piece. I totally get it. My hope for this webinar is that you will leave with at least a few tools and resources to make your life easier, at least when it comes to supporting your students with autism. Although I will be focusing on supporting students with autism in general education settings, the topics discussed today will benefit many, if not all, of your students with and without disabilities. At the Kentucky Autism Training Center, we provide services across the state to improve the quality of life of those affected by autism spectrum disorder. We work a lot in schools, with parents, with self-advocates, with other professional groups, providing training and technical assistance. If you haven't already done so, please check out our website and our social media that are linked here, our Facebook, our YouTube, and our Twitter and reach out to us if there's anything that we could provide for you in the future. Autism is a neurological disorder typically diagnosed by the age of three and affects three main areas of development, social interactions with others, communication with others, and the range of activities or behaviors. The most recent statistics from the Centers for Disease Control show that one in 54 children are diagnosed with autism, and out of those, for every four boys identified, there was one girl identified with autism. So in order to get a medical diagnosis of autism, one must have deficits in all three of these areas. The first area is deficits in social-emotional reciprocity. That just means that back and forth component of conversation, understanding that conversation is a two-way street and that I share interests with, with others, they share their interests with me. There will also be deficits in nonverbal behaviors, all of those gestures and body language and eye contact that we typically use in social interactions as well as deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. As neurotypical adults, you or I understand that we can adjust our behavior to different contexts. The conversations that we have at work may be a little different than the conversations we have at home. Our students with autism will have a very difficult time adjusting their behaviors, sharing an imaginative play. So how do you see some of these characteristics? and your students with autism. When it comes to social communication and social interaction, you may see some difficulties with taking turns or staying on topic, having imaginary play or even hypothetical scenarios, participating in partner or group work, and possibly interrupting peers or other adults. Additionally, in order to receive a medical diagnosis of autism, one must have deficits in at least two of these four areas. The first one are those stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech, things like hand flapping, lining up toys, having repeated words or phrases. The second is that insistence on routines and having those patterns of behavior, being very upset at even what may seem like a small change. The next piece are those highly restricted or fixated interests, and oftentimes those are abnormal, either in intensity or focus. Your student may have an interest that is something that their same age peers are not interested in, or they may know every single detail or fact about a certain interest of theirs. And the last piece 
is that reactivity to sensory input, having very different reactions to sounds or textures or smells, maybe even some visual fascination with lights or movements. So how have you seen some of these characteristics in your students with autism? When it comes to restricted repetitive behaviors, you may see some repeated sounds, words, or phrases. Your students may have meltdowns when their sensory overload happens. Some of your students may stem or have self-stimulatory behaviors. They may have difficulty with schedule changes. And again, that sensory overload when there is just too much sensory input coming in and they're not able to filter it out. Dr. Stephen Shore is a university professor who also has autism, and we at the Kentucky Autism Training Center love using this quote of his, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So just as you and I are different, your students with autism are going to be very different. And just as no two individuals with autism are the same, Not every strategy or tool that we discussed today will work for every student every time. In addition to the characteristics discussed earlier, such as social communication and restricted or repetitive behaviors, there are some additional learning style differences that your students with autism spectrum disorder will more than likely have. They may have some delays or some issues with executive functioning or organizing their thoughts and their learning. There will be some issues with sensory processing, filtering out that unnecessary sensory input and focusing on the sensory input that's truly important. Taking in auditory information may be difficult. Oftentimes, students with autism are visual learners and they need to see information as well as hearing it. With implicit learning, you or I, as neurotypical adults, have just kind of picked up on things over the years, either by watching an older sibling or by watching those around us and learning what to do and not do. Your students with autism will probably need more explicit instruction to know specifically what to do and not do. They may also have what's called sticky attention, where they have a difficult time disengaging from a task and shifting to another task. And they may also have difficulty understanding the perspectives of others and understanding that people have different thoughts and different beliefs. In the work that we do at the KATC, we focus solely on evidence-based practices. We understand that teachers don't have time to waste. So we're going to focus on what research has proven time and time again to be effective. Here you see 27 evidence-based practices for autism spectrum disorder. And these have been studied for many years to show that they truly can have a positive impact on learners with autism across the lifespan. So take a look at this list. Are you currently using any of these in your classroom? I'm sure you're probably using modeling, prompting, and many others. You may just not realize it. If you've accessed the PDF version of these slides, you are able to click on this image and access a larger matrix that can be a pretty handy tool to pull up each of those 27 evidence-based practices and break it down by age range. There's 0 to 5, 6 to 14, and 15 to 22 years old, as well as by different domain across the top to help narrow your search and see possibly where to begin. And anywhere throughout this presentation that you see that mouse pointer icon, that indicates that you can click on text or an image on that slide to open an additional slide. There are four main strategies to support the success of your students with autism that we will talk about. The first one is going to be antecedent-based interventions. So what are antecedent-based interventions? Basically, it's doing everything you can ahead of time to set students up to be successful. We want to try to eliminate or at least reduce 
some triggers or some anxieties that they have, or set up scenarios that provide opportunities for them to have replacement behaviors that we're working on. So it's setting up events or circumstances before an interfering or problem behavior even has a chance to occur. There are six main types of antecedent-based interventions, and we're going to go through each one of those. The first one is using learner preferences. So I want you to think for a moment. What are your high interest areas? Think about the things that you collect or the hobbies that you do in your free time. What's your favorite TV show to binge watch? How do you treat yourself after a long day or a long week? What do you love so much that you may have permanently tattooed it on your body? Just as you and I have high interest areas or things that we're really interested in, our students with autism also have those high interest areas. And as I mentioned earlier, some of those may be a bit unconventional or may not be what their same aged peers are into. But there are many opportunities for us to incorporate our students' preferences throughout their day. Um, Sometimes it's giving them the option of paper versus digital assignments, letting them write about the different topics that they're interested in, sometimes simply changing the color of their paper or pencil. I had a student who, if you gave her a pencil, she wouldn't really write very much or for very long. But if you gave her a purple marker, she would write anything you asked her to. There's another strategy called power cards that I won't get into in depth today, but they incorporate student interests as a social um, regulation type of resource. And I encourage you to check out social narratives, which are one of those evidence-based practices, for more information on power cards. Even incorporating student interests into other self-regulation tools, such as their zones of regulation, or incorporating their interests into their schedules or their visual cues throughout their day. Another way we can set students up for success as an antecedent-based intervention is to just change a part of their schedule or routine. We know that some activities may be better suited for the morning or the afternoon. Sometimes we can use a first thin board, which we'll talk about more in depth shortly. Using visual timers to help our students know how much time is left. Labeling parts of the classroom so they are able to navigate the classroom more independently and know where to go to get certain items. And incorporating visual schedules to help them understand what I do first, second, and third. A third type of antecedent-based intervention is to implement pre-activity interventions. So if you know there is a certain activity or time of day that your student may be more likely to struggle, this is where we need to jump in and give them a little bit of extra support. We may need to review those assignment components or expectations a bit more in depth or more individually with them instead of just going over it with the whole class. They may need a visual activity schedule, again, to be able to check off or know what are the pieces that I need to be accomplishing. Providing warnings before transitions or schedule changes. Um, The image in the top right corner is one of my favorites. I know we don't always have visual timers handy. Um, So just a simple five, four, three, two, one countdown can be very helpful. Even written on a post-it note, it doesn't have to be something elaborate with laminating and Velcro. So every minute or so, you can walk by and remove one of the numbers so they know they have about three minutes left or that they're getting close to that one and that their task is almost complete. And the last one are step-by-step visual directions, allowing students to flip through pages of something or check off directions as they are working independently. Another piece of this is using clear, concise directions. Remember, your students with autism, 
may have difficulty with abstract concepts. They can be very literal black and white thinkers. So, so many times we give directions that we assume they understand and should be able to follow, but they may be too abstract. So instead of saying some kind of vague or abstract things like clean up your area or let's get to work or, oh, time to get ready to go home or something very lengthy like, all right, Johnny, I need you to come over here and sit down so we can start snack time. Sometimes that's way too many words. So try things instead that are very specific and very clear and very concise. Tell them exactly what you need them to do in that moment such as put the crayons in the box or put your folder in your backpack or just simply come sit please. A similar piece that I encourage you to visit this link at the bottom, Chloe Rothschild is an adult self-advocate with autism and she presented recently on how helpful using closed-ended statements are for her. So she really needs to know some sort of quantity or some sort of more concrete explanation for what she is expected to do. So instead of saying, eat your lunch, if someone tells her to take 10 more bites, that allows her to better know and better prepare for what she's expected to do. Um, that last one is something that we say often in class. You know, we can't do that right now or, oh, no, we don't have time for that that can trigger a lot of anxiety for students with autism because they may feel like they're never going to be allowed to do that ever again. So letting them know we can do that in 30 minutes or we'll be able to do that on Friday gives them a much more closed-ended statement instead of an open-ended, vague statement that they may not necessarily understand. Some other pre-activity interventions you can use are using movement, sensory, or brain breaks. Most elementary classrooms take advantage of Go Noodle or Cosmic Kids Yoga, but sometimes it's just being able to stop and take a breath and shift your attention for a minute. Um, being able to just turn your brain off for a few seconds or do something fun or just do nothing at all. And then finally, being able to alter the amount or type of work there's a concept called behavioral momentum or high probability requests, and they can be very powerful, especially for students with autism during a task that is difficult for them or one that they're not necessarily interested in. So basically what you do is you give a task that they either enjoy or they can do very well and very easily. Give them a few of those tasks to get that momentum going and then slide in the task or request that they may be less likely to follow. So just to get them started in a task, and there's lots of different ideas there. One of the easiest that I used in the classroom was taking a worksheet that they had to do and folding it in half. That immediately made it a little more easy to get started with and a little less overwhelming. Sometimes we had to take it a step further. We would fold it in half and then we would circle three or five problems to start with, and that at least gets that momentum going. There's a resource linked here on this slide, and I will apologize. I typically only share free resources because that is my favorite four-letter word as a teacher, um, but these are some high-probability request cards that were free at one time through Bias Behavioral, but now I believe they're $4. But if anything, I encourage you to check that out and get some ideas of some quick tasks that you can use with students to get that be behavioral momentum going and get them a little more successful in beginning tasks. This next antecedent-based intervention is allowing for student choice. And I cannot stress how important and how easy this is to incorporate throughout your school day. I will also admit that I was a self-proclaimed control freak teacher. I had a very difficult time letting go of certain aspects and not being in control of every single part of my day and my students' day. So I also want to preface this by saying this is not allowing students to have free reign and have 
free access to everything and really call the shots. These are still teacher controlled choices. Oftentimes it's presenting two or three options in the moment that you are okay with as a teacher and that are available for your students. So sometimes it's simply asking a student, do you want to work alone or with a friend? Who do you want to work with? Asking them where they'd like to work. It could even be, do you want to work in this chair or that chair? Even though they're identical, it allows the student to have some control and some choice in the matter. Asking the student about their reinforcers, what they're going to work for, and we'll talk about those more in depth shortly. Asking students what materials they'd prefer to use. Think back to my friend who would prefer markers over pencils or doing things on the computer versus on paper. And finally, with the order of tasks. We have these three tasks to get accomplished today. We're going to get all three finished, but which one do you want to start with first? And allowing students to have some control in the matter and get that momentum going, getting them more likely to participate. Choice boards can be a great visual for times during the day when a student often has choices. Um, They allow the student to see that visual representation of their options. And it also allows you as the teacher to, again, control the choices that are available. If something is not available that day or during that time, you can quickly take it off of the choice board and that's not presented as an option. So here are some ideas for choice boards that have been used with students throughout the day. The one on the far left has a great not an option label that has been placed over ones, whether it's um, an iPad and the battery is dead or whether it's something that another student is using at that time. It's not an option right now. Um, Having choices for times like snack or choices for toys during free play even what sensory items they'd like to use during that activity or during the day. There are also plenty of ways to incorporate choice boards and student choice and academic concepts. And there's a link on this slide that will take you to a Google folder with lots of different academic choice boards. The fifth type of antecedent-based interventions is to alter the way that you're giving instruction, making sure that you're providing a combination of written instructions as well as verbal instructions, having text read aloud also silently, giving students the option to have partner and or small group, highlighting directions for them so that they can understand what they need to be attending to, and then this last one, Altering the types of responses can be very powerful. Some of your students may be non-speaking and have a very difficult time participating in, in group lessons. They may have verbal language, but they may be having a really bad day, and they may not be willing or able to participate in a discussion. So using things like a thumbs up or a thumbs down, using a program such as Plickers to get a nice scan of responses in your classroom, or using apps such as the Verbal Me Sampler app that allows students to choose yes or no answers or multiple choice answers to be able to still participate even if it's not using spoken language. And the last type of antecedent-based intervention is to help alter their sensory stimuli, giving students options to fidget with, have in their hands. Now, these have to be taught. I learned the hard way sometimes. Things that I would have not expected I needed to teach students, such as silly putty doesn't belong in the teacher stapler. We learned that one the hard way. Um, Also, I always prefer fidget items that are quiet and don't make a mess. So thinking of things like stress balls, silly putty, uh, bits of string, fabric strips put on a key ring, even little glue dots. So when you get a new debit card or something in the mail and you know that piece of sticky glue, sometimes students really enjoy having those that you can buy in a box um, to be able to roll between their fingers. It can be under the desk. It doesn't make noise. No one really knows they have it, but it helps them with their sensory input. 
finding ways for modified seating if you have that available either through your occupational therapist or through just different types of seating in your classroom. And adjusting the lighting or noise level. Especially when I taught high school, there were times when we broke dress code and my students were allowed to wear sunglasses or a hat in the classroom or in the hallways. Because if that was what they needed to filter some sensory input, I was going to allow them to wear those. This is a final slide for this section um, that really helps, again, identify some of your students will be sensory seeking. They just can't get enough sensory input and they're always trying to find that. And other students may be very sensory sensitive where they are getting too much sensory input and they kind of try to hide away from that or need to escape that. There are lots of resources linked here for you. I encourage you to visit this adult preference sensory motor checklist and fill that out as an adult and see what are the sensory behaviors that you do during the day to help regulate your systems. And there are some other strategies and activities that you may be able to implement with students. So our next piece is going to be talking about reinforcement. And before we get started with this, if you haven't already done so, I'm going to encourage you to press pause, take a brief break, whether that's just to stand up and stretch or close your eyes for 10 seconds. Do something to reset. We've been sitting for about 25 minutes now. Um, so press pause and we will get started right back with reinforcement. Our second strategy for success in general education settings is reinforcement. So these are the pieces that are going to come after a behavior, and these are desired behaviors. These are the behaviors that we want our students to be doing, ways that we can provide reinforcement to keep those behaviors happening. We want to encourage our students to, to have those positive desired behaviors. So, so many times we think that we are reinforcing students. We think, oh, well, we gave them a sticker. We gave them a high five. And sometimes that's not necessarily reinforcement in that it doesn't lead to an increase of that behavior in the future. Also, sometimes we may accidentally reinforce behaviors that we didn't mean to. We are human. We make mistakes. And sometimes our students are just funny and they say things that make us laugh or they do something and we accidentally respond in a way that reinforce that behavior. Even saying things like, shh, no, or stop that. Well, if the student was trying to get our attention and they got it by throwing something across the room, we've reinforced that behavior because we gave them the attention that they were desiring. One wonderful and easy, no-cost way to provide reinforcement for students, especially if their behaviors are typically trying to get adult attention, is to provide behavior-specific praise. And this also goes back to one of those characteristics of autism where students need very explicit instruction. Simply saying good job or nice work may be too abstract for your students with autism. They need to know in that moment what specific thing that they are doing well that you as their teacher would like for them to keep doing. So here are lots of different sentence stems for you to use. And I encourage you to use these with all of your students throughout the day. In those moments where you can catch them being good and naming that very specific behavior that you appreciate them doing or that you want them to keep doing. There's also an article linked here. If you click on that blue box, that will take you to an article about, I think it was three helpful ways to remember to use behavior-specific praise during the day. With reinforcement, there are lots of different ways to determine what's reinforcing to your students. What are things that they're willing to work for? Or what are the things that they're really interested in and would like to have as part of their reinforcement breaks? 
a lot of times we can just observe them. What are the things that they're doodling in their notebook during the free time? What activities do they do over and over again on the playground? Or if they had free access to things in your classroom, what would they go for? Also having interviews or surveys, simply asking the student, their parents, asking the bus drivers. They may know, well, so Johnny loves to sing this song all day, every day on the bus. Or in the cafeteria, they may know what snack foods that they want to pile onto their trays. There are ways to complete some more formalized preference assessments. Um, I have a few, I have one linked here, um, but also encourage you if you want to know more about that to either reach out to me or to one of the special education teachers in your building. They have probably completed preference assessments at some point. And also just presenting a menu of choices, whether that's a choice board or having a box or a basket of possible reinforcing items and seeing what they gravitate towards and what they reach for first. If you have a student who has either never been on a reinforcement system or is in the pretty beginning stages of learning, I encourage you to begin with a first-then board. It is the most simple, straightforward reinforcement system to begin with. So you first need to identify what items are reinforcing to your students, figuring out what are some things that they really enjoy doing, using, or accessing. This is going to feel and sound very strange, but in the beginning of a first then system, you have to give the student two preferred activities, first preferred, then preferred, sometimes over several days. Your students are going to think they hit the lottery because they're going to say, what do you mean? I get to do two great things? What is happening here? But that's going to get their buy-in, and that's going to help them understand this system. That first, I do one activity, then I do another activity. Then you're going to slowly back that first item or activity into something that's a little less preferred. Eventually, until you can get to a non-preferred task, such as first we have to tidy up, then we get to go outside. But the then needs to always be something that's highly preferred, something that the students are really interested in and really would like to work for. So let's take a look at an example. In the beginning of this system, you may have a student who absolutely loves the iPad. That's what they always want. That is their top reinforcer. But they also really enjoy Legos. So in the beginning of this system, first they're going to get, get to play with Legos, then they get to play on the iPad. And definitely set some timers with this. So maybe first five minutes of Legos, then 10 minutes on the iPad. Um, so 15 minutes out of the day teaching this system for the student. And again, they're going to think that they've hit the lottery. First I get to do Legos, then I get the iPad. This is great. I love this system. So after a few days with that, you may have it say first we get to do puzzles which your student still really enjoys a little bit less than iPads and Legos but they really still enjoy puzzles. So first we get to do 10 minutes of a puzzle then you get 10 minutes on the iPad and you're slowly again going to work that first item or activity to something less and less preferred so that eventually your first thing can look like this. First we need to do small group then you get 10 minutes on your iPad. The next type of reinforcement system is a token system. These are called token boards, token economies, but they all have the same major components. There is a list of target behaviors or maybe just one behavior that your student really needs to focus on right now. And then they're gonna earn tokens or points every time that they emit that target behavior. So whether it's raising their hand or having nice hands or some sort of other behavior that you really want to reinforce for them. 
And they're going to have all kinds of reinforcers or preferred items to choose to obtain once they have earned all of their tokens. So this is a nice way to fade out from the first then, where it's not first I do one task and then I get my reinforcement. Now I may have to do four things or I may have to do five different behaviors or tasks before I can earn my reinforcement break. And I also love these two pictures because they show, again, that the things that your students may want to work for or the, the things that are reinforcing to them may not be what you would expect. So the student on the left, he loved to work to be able to push around a shopping cart. That is what he enjoyed doing, and he would work. He would earn his four tokens so that he could spend a few minutes pushing his shopping cart. The student on the right loved to cut up small pieces of paper to make little bits of confetti, and he would fill a gallon bag if we would let him. So he was working towards five tasks to complete, and then he got to take his reinforcement break to, to rip or cut pieces of paper. Token systems are a great visual to help students understand that their behaviors have a cause and effect. When I do these things, I'm earning my stars or my check marks. Um, they are able to see that they have those appropriate behaviors and they're getting feedback. And they may also start getting really excited when they only need one star or when they have two out of their three check marks and they're getting very close to meeting their goal for that moment. They're also a great reminder for the adults to make sure that we are focusing on those students and we are truly trying to find those opportunities that they are emitting those appropriate desired behaviors. Just a few helpful tips. Make sure that whatever system you're using is durable. This is something that you're going to be using multiple times throughout the day in multiple settings. So using tokens that are durable or a system that's durable um, also considering students' interest when creating tokens, so whether they're earning five Marios or Luigi's to then earn their prize, um, or some token boards, there's some I linked here that even relate to some student interests. Also, it's very important to deliver tokens or points or check marks immediately. Sometimes we can get caught up and a 30 minute window has passed and we say, oh, Johnny, you know what? You did such a great job during math group here. Here's your three check marks. You earned them. That's not going to be as meaningful to Johnny and he's not going to be able to make that true connection between his behaviors and how they've been reinforced. So please keep in mind to give those reinforcers immediately as soon as they happen, if at all possible. We also have to make sure that our reinforcers stay powerful. So we may want to limit that access. If a student can get on an iPad multiple times throughout the day, they may, that may not be as powerful as a reinforcer for their token system or their first then. So we may need to keep certain objects put away that they can only access once they have earned their tokens. Um, we're gonna talk here in a minute about gradually increasing demands and ways to fade reinforcers. But on this slide, I have two free um, different links to some nice, easy, printable token boards if you're interested in those. Additionally, I want to make sure that you realize that reinforcers don't have to be things like Cheetos and iPads. They don't always necessarily have to be edibles or tangibles. There are so many different ideas that people have come up with that are free, low cost, and things that you may not have thought of that students would want to work for or that are reinforcing to them. So here I have linked an article that has 75 pages of ideas of things that your students may be willing to work for. So I encourage you to check that out. Additionally, we need to always have in mind a plan to fade reinforcement. We know in the real world, someone is not going to be following our students around with a first thin board or giving them tokens every time that they do something great or something that other people desire. So in the beginning of systems, we're usually having a fixed ratio. What that means is that every one time or every two times or every three tokens, students are earning reinforcement. 
we may have to start shifting to what's called a variable ratio. So think about a slot machine. You don't know that every 10 pulls is going to hit a jackpot, but there is a system set up in that device to have an average of so many pulls is going to give access to a jackpot. There are ways to use devices such as a gym boss or a motivator. They are just little interval timers. There's even free apps, I'm sure, on every app store. And you can set these either at a fixed ratio, so it, it will buzz, beep, every 10 seconds, every 30 seconds. But you can also set it on a variable ratio so that an average of every minute or so or every 30 seconds, it will alert and let you be able to provide that reinforcement to a student. Also so that they don't necessarily know when it's coming and they're not watching the clock to know, oh, it's been 15 minutes, my teacher's gonna come check on me now. We may also want to increase the type or amount of demands. So either increasing the amount of tokens that they need to earn, or instead of just focusing on one behavior to earn tokens, maybe now we need to focus on two. Instead of having nice hands, now we need to have nice hands, nice feet, and nice words. So making it a little bit harder for them to, to earn those reinforcers. We also need to consider the schedule. You know, are students receiving reinforcement on an hourly basis? Would they may be able to push towards a half day? They get an a.m. and a p.m. reinforcement break. Do they maybe just need one a day? Can they handle just a midweek on a Wednesday and a Friday? I understand that we can't all make it to Friday. So it's going to be up to you and your team supporting the student to know what can they truly manage and meet them where they are in this moment. Our next strategy for success, and we've talked about this all throughout today because it is just a core component of working with students with autism, um, is incorporating visual supports. And some specific types of visual supports, there are three main categories. The first is visual schedules. The second is visual boundaries. And the third is visual cues. And there are some questions here that I encourage you to read through and see where do your students fall? Which of these types of visual supports might they need the most? Or which one should you possibly start with? Because as I mentioned earlier, we're not going to be able to incorporate all of these strategies all the time for every student and have them be effective. We just need to sometimes pick one and try that for a little while. With visual schedules, there are so many different questions you can ask yourself. No two visual schedules typically look the same. Some students are on object schedules where they have actual small items that they are taking to different areas. Some are able to follow picture schedules with either photographs or um, picture communication icons. And some are able to follow a written schedule with words. There are lots of different questions to ask. Again, with variation, are they able to understand what a clip art image represents? Do they need a more um, actual realistic photograph? Are they able to use single words, short phrases? Also, what's the length of their schedule going to be? Do they need just kind of that first then or just giving them one aspect of their schedule at a time? Can they have a sequence of four events to follow? Are they able to have a half day or a full day schedule? What's going to be meaningful to your student without overwhelming them and also the adults who are having to manage and get this system in place? Where is their schedule going to be located? Is it going to be in a certain area of the classroom that they go to throughout the day? Is it going to be portable? Where is this schedule going to be located consistently for the student? Also, what's the routine to check? In the beginning, students are going to need reminders to go check their schedule. Now, don't tell them, oh, check your schedule, it's time for lunch. Because why do they need to check their schedule? You just told them it's time for lunch. But students are going to need, oftentimes, in the beginning, verbal or visual reminders to go check their schedule to know what to do next. 
Also, there are lots of different ways to manipulate their schedule, whether it's matching pictures to other pictures, turning pictures over, putting them in a pocket, checking a box, marking it off. And I'm going to show you lots of pictures of some different types of visual schedules. So this is just another representation of a way to work through and see what would your student be most able and willing to follow. And also, again, as the adult, what are you able to manage and help them set up and help them access throughout the day? So some visual schedules, some of them are just for certain activities, whether it's washing their hands or if they have a calm down area that they need to go to and this is the schedule that they follow. It may be for some table work time where they have these tasks that they check off and then they um, go to the next area. Sometimes it's a, an activity of three or a set of three activities that they're following in their visual schedule. These can be located on clipboards or in binders that helps them to become a bit more portable. And also as your students get older, if it's in a binder, it's a little less obvious to other students what they have and what they're using. Um, so again, knowing, can your student uh, read and follow the words of a visual schedule? Are they able to read and mark off check boxes? Um, can they take a card off of a paper clip and put it into a pocket? or take a picture off of Velcro and Velcro it to something else. Lots of different ways to have students navigate their day using a visual schedule. Visual boundaries can be very helpful for your students with autism to understand where their body should be in space and also where items are located. So if at all possible, using things like shelves or partitions boundary tape, carpets, rugs, to help them understand what different areas of the classroom mean. Um, boundary tape can be very helpful, but also just keep in mind you cannot just put it on the floor and expect your students to understand what that means. They're going to need some teaching and some prompting around what that tape means. Um, different things like name tags and footprints to line up. Simple things like stop signs can help them be a nice visual reminder to either not access a certain door or sometimes I've seen this even in student binders or in a book that they're reading. If we're going to read five pages today, I'll put a stop sign there at the end so that they are aware of how much we're reading today and where they need to stop. The third type of visual support are visual cues. They, along with visual schedules and visual boundaries, are a great alternative to repeating yourself 50 times a day. Students are going to hear your words, but they will understand your visuals. So some examples of visual cues are, again, that task analysis or that list of steps, activities that they need to meet, some volume or proximity meters. I have those linked here on the slides. So instead of telling students that they're getting too loud, you can simply point the arrow towards that as a nice visual reminder. Um, additionally, some emotional regulation tools, which we'll talk about here in the last section. Um, but these, again, don't need to be elaborate. They could be a simple index card or a piece of notebook paper with a written reminder of breathing strategies or counting strategies or materials that they need to bring to small group. On the far left are some visual cues that you can put on a key ring, and I have those linked for free. It'll take you to a PDF version of all of those single word visual cues that you will pair with verbal cues in the beginning, but then eventually simply showing them or pointing to those cues should be enough. And all of these visual supports are gonna be able to help your students become more independent and allow them to complete their tasks and navigate their day without an adult having to be there to prompt them. All right, deep breath. Our last strategy for success are some emotional regulation tools. And I so appreciate that schools all across the state and the country and the world even, are focusing so much on social emotional wellness, um, mindfulness. This is something that 
is coming to the forefront of education. And I'm so appreciative of that. So I'm going to just give you a few things to think about when it comes to your students with autism regulating their emotions. So one type of system or strategy is called zones of regulation. A lot of schools are going to this. They're incorporating even um, aspects of the movie Inside Out, where we identify our emotions based on colors or zones. Um, I was very effective in using this with my students with autism if I could relate to their special interests. So you'll see I had a one student who was on a Star Wars zones of regulation, another student who was on a Pokemon system. And what made this most powerful and effective was when my students were overwhelmed, when they were getting out of the green zone and maybe they were feeling sad in the blue zone or a bit anxious or worried in the yellow zone or even going straight to the red zone, getting very angry, they weren't necessarily able to identify their emotions, but they could either point to the character or they could tell me, I'm, I feel like a C-3PO right now, or uh, they could point to which Pokemon they felt like, and we could then begin working through which strategies they have identified to get back to the green zone. So I loved using the color coding system and bringing in my students' special interests with this. Um, there is a webinar linked here. It is through Social Thinking, who has developed the zones of regulation, and it's a great, I believe it's an hour, um, but a nice introduction to the zones of regulation if you are not familiar with that one. Some additional links here for you with zones of regulation are a nice template for the toolbox. There are some portable strategy cards that can be very handy um, for students and then um, also a curriculum for early childhood that breaks down different activities and lessons and stories that you can read to go along with each of the four zones. A very similar system is the Incredible Five Point Scale. That is the work of Carrie Dunn Buren. Um, and there is a five point, again, color coded scale, but you can incorporate many different strategies or whatever your student is struggling with, you can create a five point scale for. Um, there's a great book on the right where um, Carrie Dunn Buren, as well as some other authors, are able to identified lots of different five-point scales for adolescents and adults to help manage um, their behaviors and their social interactions. Um, and then another great book on the left talking about, you know, when we get to that five zone, that red zone, that's when we're out of control and that's not okay. It happens to all of us, but there are ways that we need to be able to get back down to that green or that one. I've also linked um, Carrie Dunburen's website there, and she's got lots of great um, downloadable resources. There are also some YouTube videos that she has on the incredible five-point scale, which are very helpful. Um, finally, there are some calming and mindfulness coping skills that can be helpful for your students with autism, especially if they're presented in a choice board type setting. So I have a lot of different either visual cues or some choice boards linked here. If you click on each of these pictures, you will be taken to the free resource that you can print and access um, and also a really helpful article, 10 Tips for Teaching Emotional Regulation and also improving classroom behavior. So win-win for you and your students. The final piece of our time together, I just want to share some additional resources for you to explore during your time after this webinar and even in the days and weeks to come as you um, take all this information in and, and start making changes either currently in your classroom or thinking about future changes to possibly make in your classrooms for your students. I want to make you aware that in the state of Kentucky, we have an autism guidance document. It is on the Kentucky Department of Education website, um, but I also have the PDF linked here if you click on that icon. And I have this printed in a, pay, in a little binder, and I use it so often. It breaks down every single aspect of supporting students with autism in your classroom and is really handy, a nice kind of first step to go to if you have questions. Additionally, this is a book that I 
I thought about including a picture of mine, but then I was too embarrassed because it has been well loved. It has coffee stains, it has torn pages, it is written in, it is highlighted. This is a book that I shared with so many co-teachers throughout my teaching career, and it presents autism in a very approachable, easy to understand way with very straightforward strategies. So this is one of my favorite books to share with co-teachers. Um, it's linked here throughout Scholastic. I believe it's around $20, so fairly inexpensive, um, but a really nice resource to understand how you can support students with autism spectrum disorder in your classrooms and in inclusive settings. If you would like information on those 27 evidence-based practices, there are two different types of online training modules. There are the Affirm modules and the AIM modules that you can access free of charge for any of those 27 evidence-based practices. So I encourage you, if you want to know more about power cards, like I mentioned earlier, check out the social narratives modules. There are modules on antecedent-based interventions, and visual support and reinforcement that we talked about today, as well as many others. And there are also three additional resources linked here that have some great information on those evidence-based practices. Um, some resources that I use fairly often for, you know, free, easy to access, printable visual supports. Um, Vis Victories in Autism is linked here. Do to Learn um, has some free picture cards that you can use either on a first then system or a visual schedule. Lesson Picks is the one that I use most often. It is fairly inexpensive, um, but it allows me to create social stories, visual schedules, picture cards, anything I can imagine for my students with autism. And then Autism Teaching Strategies is a website by Joel Shaw. He is a social worker, and he's the one who created those volume meters that I linked earlier. And he has lots of different um, social skills games, speech activities, and many other free resources there. The Organization for Autism Research has some free, really great materials for teachers and parents. They are all available as PDFs on their website, but they will also send you in the mail up to two copies of each of these books free of charge. Um, they have a great teacher's corner on their website, a student corner with their kits for kids, helping other students in classrooms understand what autism is. And I have a whole list there of all the different books that they have, again, either virtually as a PDF or they will send you up to two of each of those free of charge. On our Kentucky Autism Training Center YouTube, we have some other pre-recorded webinars that we have done in the past. These are just some of the topics that related to some things that we talked about today, but I encourage you to check out our YouTube and access any other future trainings that you'd like to participate in. And if you have any questions, if there's anything that we talked about today that you would like more information on, or if there was something that you want some clarification on, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My name is Sarah Bays. Um, again, I'm with the Kentucky Autism Training Center. We are based out of the University of Louisville, but we serve the entire state of Kentucky. We are in schools all across the state. We are training parents and first responders and professionals all across the state. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything that either I can do or we at the center can do for you. And again, check us out if you haven't already done so on Facebook and Twitter. We are constantly sharing resources for parents and professionals across the state as they support loved ones or students with autism. So I thank you for your attendance today. I appreciate your engagement. I'm trusting that you were just all there frantically taking notes, even though we weren't able to be together in person or even in a live webinar. Um, but I hope you were able to take at least two or three tools away that you could see yourselves implementing in your classrooms to support your students with autism. Thank you.